Welcome to the Blue Room Weekly. Uh, we've got a full house in the house today. Uh, I've got Les, I've got Paul, I've got Pete. Um, before we start, I have to say happy birthday to Pete there, who I did before we started recording. <laughs> but everyone that listens to us needs to, need to give him a message and, and let him know. Um, he's really got some really strange uh, presence of various people, which he'll tell you all about. Um, it's probably it's probably a little bit uh, too dark to explain this on a, on a Thursday morning, but there we go. We'll tell you. He'll tell you privately if you wanna if you wanna speak to him then. Um, right, lads, we've got plenty to get through here. Uh, and well, I'd say a little bit fifty fifty on what's happened off the pitch as much as what's happened on it. The first one I'm gonna go to is probably the most spoken about issue, which is which is quite funny, really, because the first thing most people would be talking about, had this not happened, with what I'm about to say, would be Dominic Calvert Lewin's red red card, which was overturned, which people will give me pelted about, no doubt. So that's why I'm getting to it second. The first one uh, is all about this um famous, now famous, now infamous group, seven seven seven, who are basically in uh, in more turmoil um, and controversy and whatnot. If you've read the piece, which I presume not many people have, um, or they might well have heard of it, so they the first thing that they've got now financially and uh, a really difficult situation is they're in court for late payments over four planes uh, that they've had not paid for, basically. Um, and in addition to that, more obviously lower to home for us They've also given us an extra uh, $50 million loan. Now that's reached up to $180 million that they've given us since we've been linked to them. And um, Starting with you here, Pete, I think with that just indicates how desperate Machiri is to get out of this now, isn't he? When he's still seeing this type of... Um, well, they're basically making Hicks and Gillette at Liverpool look like the best owners that there's ever been, these guys. Um, I think it's pretty clear that the it's a real danger for them to take over us. Thankfully, and this is really ironic, that the Premier League are preventing them from taking over. Now, when will we ever be thanking the Premier League after what happens this season with them and ten point deductions and whatnot? But um, what what are you feeling about this, mate? Because I am uh, every time I see them mentioned in any sort of uh, newspaper, online, podcast, whatever it is. I really dread these fellas coming in. I, I honestly, every single day seems to bring up another another issue that they have, and and I think it's quite impressive that they've managed to have such a a, a wide range in portfolio with all of these different businesses that they're involved in, <laughs> and they've managed to mess up in every single one of them. When you think about it, I mean, they they'd already managed to to be late with payments for the, the UK Basketball League, which nearly went into administration <laughs> under their watch. They, I didn't know that one. It. I didn't know that yeah, one. Yeah. yeah, That was that was that was like last summer that it's uh yeah the the actual UK basketball league nearly went into administration because they hadn't paid something, you know, you're only talking of ten tens of thousands rather than millions um in a late payment. So that was that was one of them. Um obviously the football clubs that they've they're already involved with have various <laughs> issues. And now they've moved into aviation to try and <laughs> they've managed to mess up a, an aviation company as well. So it's I mean it's quite impressive when you when you think about yeah. it that they've managed to one get their grubby little mitts um involved in so many different diverse um companies, but the fact that they've managed to mess up so um impressively, but they still somehow yeah. um seem to be going through the process of back yeah. taking over Everton. What I would say is that in terms of whether or you know they will or will not get granted be granted approval uh, to take over Everton, I think a decision needs to be made immediately because how can Everton move on if, for example, they are going to be rejected by the Premier League, which I think they should be, surely, you know, given all of the circumstances, it needs to happen soon because they've got this exclusivity agreement with Everton, which means that Everton can't move on to talk to other mm -hmm. people until this is over. So. It, we've got two hands tied behind our backs. Mishiri's he's looking at it from a sense of, well, I'm not going to put any more of my personal money into it because I'm leaving. Um, I've got an agreement with these people. But it's stopping, you know, in theory, it's actually stopping Mishiri putting his own money into the club because he's of the opinion that, uh, you know, an agreement's been reached. So whatever is going to happen needs to happen very soon because if there are people waiting in the wings, they need to 
they need to be brought in very quickly if this were to to um to fall apart. Um, but I am filled with dread at the thought of seven 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 being anywhere near Everton Football Club. Um, I I think they've proven even over the last you know couple of months in ter- in terms of how they've been with us. Um, in terms of the fact that the league of uh, have taken so long to approve them. That says to me that they don't have money. Um and mm. any money that they do have, they have to they have to borrow and scrimp and scri- and, and save yeah. and, and and leverage to actually get that money, which you can't run a Premier League football club like that. You need no. people with serious money to compete. Well I I, I said this um yesterday, Paul and you know I was, I was quite astonished really that most people agree with what I said with this, but it is the lesser of two evils that Farad Mashirdin remains where he is right now. And, you know, who'd have thought we'd be saying anything like that? But I think it shows you an example of what what this group, in inverted commas, um, trying to come in and, and, and get their, uh, like uh, Pete said, their, their grubby hands on us. It's it's a massive concern for me, as well as everything else that's going on the pitch as well. I mean, it, I can't be of any help in and around what's going on uh, at Everton trying to stay in the Premier League. You know, it, it just has the whole sort of sense of instability and lack of direction, lack of strategy that's kind of plagued the club for years. Also begs the question, you know, uh, why Mashiri got into it, got into bed with seven seven seven. I mean, you know, did they have did they have connections with them? You know, did, was that the only offer on the table? Uh, like Peter said there as well. I think my big concern is this exclusive exclusivity arrangement that they have because that kind of delays any other potential investors getting on board as well. <laughs> Of course, the nightmare scenario is this drags on. We get relegated and suddenly the interest in taking over Everton declines because we're not a Premier League club anymore. So we haven't got that revenue stream as well. I mean, going back to 777, I mean, uh, I mean I, you know, Paul Essig has been really good uh, on Twitter. He, he raised concerns for a long, long time about S, about 777. He's been quite forensic going through the processes, the details of, of his concerns as well. It's not it's not a biased viewpoint. It is quite logical based on financial mm. knowledge. And it just strikes me that, you know, <clears throat> Peter said there about the fact they haven't got any the money. So it's almost like the Glazers at Manchester United, isn't it? These guys yeah. spend yeah. their own money. They bring money in from here, they leave it as money, they get loans, but they never actually let their own money be be spent in any respect. Yeah. So it's a very typical American sports business model that you buy into a club, but you don't actually use your own money to buy into the club. And then once you're in the club, you start to generate revenue from advertising, sponsorship, yeah. et cetera. And, yeah. and that's the way you progress things. And I think you know, those 777 are kind of following that that model that's been quite successful for a number of US businessmen over the years. But you know, I think you always have a concern when US businessmen are coming in because you know they have a different approach to what, what, what kind mm. of used to in terms of football ownership here as well. Um I think, Peace, you mentioned a, a while ago about your big concern was about if they do come in and they need funds, the obvious route there is that they sell the stadium and we end up renting the stadium. And the one thing we cannot do is allow Bramley Moor Dock to be taken away from Everton because if we lose <coughs> control of that stadium, we are going to be <coughs> in an incredibly difficult position. Do you know, do you know that's a really interesting point there, Les, about, about the stadium. Now, the the way I I spoke about it in literally a sentence, trying to talk about them, and it feels like the the group of people who get loans so they can get in a club, take more loans. Then the loans come in, they end up getting to some sort of level where they can then sell what they've bought with some sort of profit. They give the loans back, and then they've made the profit to carry on again. Um, coming to <laughs> coming to a club like us. It's just not going to work. And then, like like Paul said, that that sort of US model with the NFL and whatnot, the sort of the, the sort of things happening there with Wrexham, isn't it? That sort of thing is coming forward. Although the benefit with Wrexham is you've you've got a couple of billionaires who've taken over there and like to have a bit of fun with it. Um, you know, <laughs> we certainly don't need any fun that's going on at Goodison at the moment. And <laughs> you know, you, you we were talking about them just before we started there, Les. It's it's petrifying when you think about it without the the laughs and jokes about what they're like. Yeah, I've just looked. I've just googled them, and the, the <laughs> sort of the first line of the of the results is seven 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 partners is an alternative investment platform. So I guess the alternative is just you, you just don't pay people. <laughs> I think. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. 
yeah, at, at, at the ground, it, that's what really, really worries me because I, I honestly don't think they'd be particularly interested in Everton if it wasn't for the ground. I think Mashiri's long game all along wasn't it was to build the stadium and probably sell the club on at a profit. Obviously, the club being in a much healthier position, or he envisaged the club will be in a much healthier position on the field than it is at the minute. But basically, all we've got going for us at the minute is that stadium. So you can see why an invest an alternative investment platform like seven 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 would be interested because they know no matter what happens on the field, they will have a state of the art, like literally best ground in the country at their disposal. Um, and as Paul said, if they do sell that from under us, that's an absolute disaster for the club because you just, you know, I'd sooner stay at Goodison and have that, that that's ours. We own that. Yeah. And no matter what, no one can really take it away from us because it's our ground. Obviously, you go into administration, you get like complications around that. But I don't think any club's ever ever been in that much of a state that they've had like an old ground that they've always owned bought from under them. So I don't think that would ever be a, a possibility with Goodison. But with the new ground, I think it very much is a possibility. I think even if the club's in a good state, they might do it anyway because they can. And it, you know, it, it's a huge, huge investment possibility for them. That isn't it. If they, if they can add that to the dodgy airlines and the basketball league, but they've got something that's actually tangible, built, it, you know, the, the, the investment opportunities for that are huge. They can make a lot of money on the back of that, which wouldn't be good for the club because it wouldn't be going back into the club. And you know, you look at, I think the only, the only sort of relative success story they've got appears to be, I think it's Genoa. Isn't it? Who mm-hmm. seem to be doing okay, and um, but everyone else they're involved with, and I think there's something. I think there's something dodgy about Genoa, Genoa as well, to be honest. Um, but everyone it's else, not, is- the, the one about Genoa is that it's not actually them. They they've got shit. <laughs> there you go. That makes sense then. Yeah, that's it. They've, they've <laughs> they're able to tell everyone in in adverts and whatnot. But I think they had a, a certain percentage of a uh, an investment there when uh, Genoa have done have done well. Without them being, with them just being beneficial of it rather than actually doing anything with it. I think the okay. point you made, it all is, it's it gets me that it, in in simple terms, it looks like they get in Everton as soon as they can, get as much profit as they can, which I.e. would be selling the stadium and then getting out and, okay. and leaving us in the mire. Um, and it's, you know, go on, sorry. Just on that, so it's like, um, like the lad said before about the the Man United model. <laughs> Hmm. Man United can absorb that and survive with it because they were in such a good position when they got bought by the Glazers. You know, that at, at, the, at that time, they were the biggest club in the world, with, without a doubt. Um, and they got bought and they, they've they had a slow decline. Now, you could say it's cyclical. It, it was always going to come to that when Alex Ferguson left because it, it's so difficult to carry on a period of success, like to maintain it that long. So football wise, that could have just been a cyclical thing where you know mm. not not replace the manager well. All these things come to an end. Clubs go through transitions. They've been on a transition now for about ten years. It's kind of coincided with that ownership model, um, which never seems to be what's best for the club. The decisions they've been making have been bad around the management, the playing staff. But they were in such a good position that they can you know they can absorb finishing fourth, yeah. fifth, sixth, seventh. We can't. We can't we can't get into a position whereby we go through a transition and we drop a couple of places because we're down there. And then that, if you look at, if you, if you pair that with this sort of ownership model, that would be disastrous. Yeah. Like, well, that's it. I mean, <laughs> I was joking about this, that they were like the Venkies and I can imagine us, all of our lads doing av- advertising for KFC or something like that when they, <laughs> they end up taking over. But you spot on there, um, just going to you on this one, Pete, um, you know, you spot on in terms of what happened with United there is possibly the equivalent of what's going to happen with us. But with United, like let's said there, the, the sort of who they were, what they had, stadium, what well, they got 70 odd thousand stadium wise, income that comes in there, revenue wise, and stuff like that. Even though they've been come financially, it's a really difficult situation until uh, Ratcliffe took over there now, hasn't he? A multi billionaire. So, you know, things what what's the company called? Ineos, is it? Ineos. That 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 yeah, that that sort of thing. Pete, I mean, we we don't have the luxury of that because you've then got 
United there, uh, the worst season for them is just missing out on the top four. That's not that's no big deal for them whatsoever. For us, <laughs> you know, if we have a, if we have a bad season, and you know, I mentioned before we started there, there's a there's a huge game tomorrow night with um, Burnley at home to Luton, which I'm pretty much begging for a draw in that game because if if Burnley win, I think they go to two points behind us. Uh, if Luton win, the inevitable they they go above us. So that's a, that's a massive game for us to be looking at. Had to play in Aston Villa, which we'll get into in a second. But do you, do you get more and more scared by this, Pete? With you know results that we've had recently, that extra that um, replay we've got coming up as well. Uh, I, I don't know the views of it. I, I imagine I'm in a small, a small amount of fans who say that I really could do without it. I wouldn't mind it if we'd have gone out of the FA Cup at that time. Um, how are you feeling about it all at the moment, mate? Well, it's um, in the short term. I think, I think, but well, you know, in terms of the things that we can, we do have some say over. I, I think, in terms of how we've been playing our football, um, certainly over the last few months, even with some bad results, other than the Wolves game, which I think was a was a blip, a, a huge blip in terms of performance. I think we're actually performing okay on the pitch. Um, what worries me is when you hear things that you know rumours about how much influence 777 could be having on us or or certainly the, the situation we find ourselves in financially is to whether we lose any more players between now and the end of January. Um, you mean in you know, sales import, or injury? Yeah, important. Yeah, yeah. In, in terms of sales, you know, if, yeah. if for example, if we were to lose Amadou Onana, I can't see us going out and then replacing him. Um, certainly not with, with anyone you know, long term. Um, and when you look through that squad of players, there's not many saleable assets who are going to bring in a, a huge transfer fee. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, if, if if we do need to be balancing the books, and I just I, I, that that's that's what worries me the most is that if we're a rudderless ship, um, you know, and we don't have proper leadership and we don't have anyone who's actually steering the ship, um, it can all come crashing down. And, and I think. You know, the next few games, we've got a really tough run of fixtures as well in the league. The next four games are really, you know, they are tough fixtures. There's no hiding away from that, no shying away from that. Um, but I think, as I say, this distraction about 777 is something that should have been dealt with. Why are we still sat here? This Was was this agreed in August, was it? August, September time? Yeah, it was, so, was, yeah. Pretty much summer, yeah. And we're still sat here now. The, the January transfer window is now open and we're sat here and we don't, we're no better off in terms of where we're at as a football club. And we've got all of these distractions. We've had all of these things going on in the background, off the pitch. We've had, you know, runs of, of bad form and runs of good form on the pitch. It'd just be great to get them back to concentrating on what happens on a football pitch rather than all of this nonsense that happens off it. Um, yeah. And obviously we've then got the appeal that at some point is going to happen. We don't actually have a date for that yet. Um, I mean, it's it's difficult. It's difficult as a supporter to just go to the game and enjoy it. You you can't just go to the match, you know, to rock up at Goodison on Sunday and, mm -hmm. and watch us play Aston Villa and and potentially enjoy it, regardless of the result, because of everything else that's going on. It's so difficult to actually just concentrate on supporting eleven players on a football pitch. Yeah, do, do you know what that's that's got me thinking about with this Paul is um, you know, the last two seasons we have just about stayed up. Well, last season obviously was more comfortable, um, but by by a centimeter compared to the year before and what, what happened against Crystal Palace and all. Um, do you can you see? And look, I don't want to start. Well, people refer to me as a negative person anyway in general, but you look at those those two seasons. They were pretty much the same as in getting the points we need to stay up. This one has just got. Everything we've just spoken about in the first 20 minutes here, all mixed into the mire of how we're going to stay up. Now, I think I mentioned this when we were talking last time. I think we've got an ideal person to be the manager for it. In fact, I couldn't think of many others who are better than him to be uh, at the helm right now because, you know, he's got that similar situation he had at Burnley and keeping him in the Premier League for so, so long. I think he's got the right sort of mentality for that. But do you feel it's more difficult for us to stay up right now? And this, this is ironic because... So many people, when we got that ten point deduction, were saying that this is the best time for it to happen, given the bottom three that come up. I I don't see it that way at all. The amount of times I've watched Luton, Luton look like a half decent side. They look like a difficult side to beat. Wouldn't surprise me if they went to Burnley and won tomorrow. 
Um, you've seen what they did. I know they lost against Man City, but they looked like a side that was going to get something from them against Liverpool. They probably should have won that one. You know, there's there's plenty around us that you know is is difficult to overcome, as there has been when we've stayed up just about in the last two seasons. Yeah, I'd agree, Dave. Uh, I think as well also the, the this narrative that this this was a good season to get a ten point uh, a ten point deduction. It's nonsense because it's never yeah. a good season to get a ten point deduction. You know what planet is that a good thing for Everton as well? And, and maybe for maybe for Man United. As we yeah, said. yeah, and I think also as well, you know, all this putting down of the three teams that have come up at some stage, one of them was going to put a bit of a run together. You've seen with Luton what they done with Barkley and Towns, and ironically two ex Everton players who suddenly revived their careers at Luton there as well. And you know, like likes of Burnley and Sheffield United have got more access to money than what we've got as well. So you know, my nightmare scenario during the January window is they go out and start buying. I mean, they brought uh, Ben Bellis and Diaz, haven't they? Uh, back on loan from the other way out, Sheffield United. So already yeah. they're adding to their squads, whereas as both peace and less in the case, we're limbo transfer wise because a we've got no money to bring anybody in. B, it looks like we might have to sell people to generate funds that we then can't use. And so with a severely weakened squad and our rivals strengthening, it doesn't put us in a, a really strong position. That really does concern me as well. I'm, I'm also massively, you know, get frustrated by the way. It's kind of blasé said by the media, oh, Everton pulled those 10 points back. But we haven't pulled them back because we can't get them back unless we win the appeal. There's no... You can't win those 10 points back on the field. Yeah. That makes no sense to me whatsoever. I'm also really concerned about the, um, the, the mental impact on the Everton team because you, you're going out knowing the under pressure every game that you can't mm. afford to be below your normal top levels of performance in every match that you play. And I think that pressure will increase as the season progresses as well, particularly if we can't add some some loan signage or, or, or somebody to come in in January. And injuries, I think this season more than ever, will be key to our ability to survive because you've seen already the absence of Decore makes makes a massive difference. We don't score goals when Decore doesn't play. And so keeping him fit is a priority, but also keeping the rest of the team fit is also you know, is going to be crucial as well. I mean, can you imagine a scenario where... Jordan Pickford gets an injury and um, having to make do you know, with Joe Virginia for the rest of the season. So it, it is quite worrying times. And uh, like you, I'll be casting an anxious eye over that game on Friday evening. And the ironic thing is, before we got the points deduction, I could sit back and enjoy games like that, thinking it wasn't going yeah. to happen yeah. anymore. And now I'm back to the scenario I've been in for the last three years, watching games, definitely want a particular type of result. Yeah. Well, that's it. Maybe we, some of us have had our, have our feet up, but maybe we still had those 10 points sitting there mid-table. <laughs> get there with what? I don't think you'll leave for anywhere near 40 points this season, but you'd have 30-odd points sitting there what, in April. Looking forward to your summer away and then sorting things out when we get back to August. But um, the, the points that Paul makes there, Les, the, the, the situation with him, with these other sides as well, um, with Luton, every time I've watched them these days, Barclays turned into an Iesta. <laughs> typical us, but you know, if we're able to go and get loans in, I think the sort of first question I'd ask you about that is who'd want to come and loan who want to come to Everton right now in terms of what enough of what we need from somebody, somebody who's going to improve that 11 right now. Where's he going to get that player from on loan? Because you know, you, you the example is Dan Juma, who doesn't even get a game really too much anyway. So what 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 do you yeah. where's the solution for that? I mean it's it's annoying, isn't it? Because it feels like we've not had a proper transfer window for about five years now or something like that, doesn't it? <laughs> it it seems like every transfer window has been like, well, you can't really buy anyone. Um which it which does show how flawed the whole system is. You know, when Chelsea, who are on their arse football wise, are going, Well, we'll just buy a few more players in January and see see where we get with that. Yet where every window, probably since Benitez, isn't it? Since he spent like 1.7 million, you've not had a proper transfer window. And it's just like it's draining. And and you think, as Paul said, it must be draining on the players. Because, you know, we, we've said this in post matches. Well, it feels like they're getting flogged every week. It's the same 13 players who are out every week. Um, and, you know, I said this on post match, I think after the last game, you know, that, that is on the manager because he clearly doesn't trust certain players. So that kind of adds another layer to it that any players that we do get, you've not just got to be of the requisite quality to come in and make a difference to the side. Dice has got to like them. 
you've got to be a very Sean Dice player because you know it's like Jack Harrison. I think I think he's a very Sean Dice player. Runs around a lot. Frustrating for me because he gives the ball away an awful lot, but you can see why Dice likes him because he knows what he's getting. He's yeah. like he's the short back and sides of footballers, isn't he? He's like and that, that's <laughs> generally he likes. Um so yeah, it, it's really tricky for me to know, yeah, as you say, who's gonna want to come to Everton because it's gonna be tough unless we get these ten points back. And even if we do get the ten points back, it's still gonna be tough because we've seen over the last few games that you know this team can get beat as easily as it can win. It it seems like there's no I don't know, we look yeah, like there's no there's no in between where you think, yeah, we'll take a we'll take a point here, we'll take a draw here, you know. Yeah, there's there's not is that it, it's very much like we're gonna win or we're gonna lose. And that's like that's a really difficult position to be in. Uh, because it's like if we go a goal behind, we ain't winning that game, we're probably not gonna draw it either. Mm. If we go a goal ahead, we generally win, but even that sort even that record's gone now. So yeah, I really don't know where the players are going to come from. And as as um, Pete was saying, you know, if we sold Onana, where does that money go? Because the club has absorbed a lot of transfer funds over the last few windows. We've not seen it put back into the squad. You know, we've had it, the whole financial state of the club has been murky for a long, long time. Um, right back to when Bill Kenwright was apparently getting loans off Philip Green. Whether that happened, I don't know. But there was a lot of there's been a lot of re- like really weird lenders who've got like offshore accounts and stuff. No one quite knows where they come from. That seems to be like carrying on, but the loans are getting bigger and bigger and bigger. It's like, you know, it's like anyone who gets into debt, it gets really hard to get out of. And now you look, if, you know, we're in hot to 777 for what, 150 million quid already. That's a lot of money. That is a lot of money. Yeah. You know, when you think when we used to buy, so when we bought Lukaku, it was like, 30 million quid, 28 million quid, a lot of money. You don't get much for 28 million quid now. You say no, don't get a no. like Lukaku now. So the stakes are getting higher and higher and higher. And you think, all right, we sell Onana for like 60 quid, which I think is possibly a bit ambitious, but let's use that as the figure. How much of that goes back into the team? You know, there's yeah. a 20% sell on clause anyway. So we immediately lose 20% of that. And it's just like, we're just in a real, real mess. And you think loan signs are probably the way we're going to have to go. Um, it'd be the smart thing to do. But as you say, who do, who do we get in? Who's available? Why would they come here? Because it, even like looking under Frank Lampard, although he was a crap manager, he was a huge pull for players. People yeah. would look at Frank Lampard and go, yeah, I want to play for him. Um, you're not going to get that with Sean Dice, I'm afraid. People aren't going to look at Sean Dice and go, always wants to be in a Sean Dice side. Can't wait. So it, it's, <laughs> everything, everything just seems stacked against us at the minute. Like everything. Yeah, that that that's it with um with what he said there, Pete. I mean, you you look at Onana and, and I, look. I don't want to say there's a general naivety from people thinking that you go and get sixty odd million quid, then you can throw a load of that. Um, obviously, maybe half of it into the bank that we need to pay loans off or whatever situation it is financially, but also the other half of it can go on players where we're notoriously bad at signing players at any point, really, let alone um, the winter transfer window where we've maybe got somebody in on loan at the last a minute to go before the deadline closes. Um, that on the side of it as well, I mean, people have accused me of not being a fan of his. I think he's got he's got a real, you know, he's, he's, a, he's, a, he's a player that's going to be top class somewhere. I don't look at Everton and see that's going to be the place. So therefore, you know, you're you're probably going to have to sell him as an investment. Possibly similar to what we said about Brantwaite, who's already a world class centre back, as far as I'm concerned. But you you look at say Onana goes there, and some actually people are saying to me, "Oh, we should do what Brighton did with uh, Caicedo going to Chelsea for 105 million. Where where are you selling him to 105 million quid for?" I can't believe people were saying this sort of thing. You're also cash strapped. So if say if Arsenal was linked who comes in and said, Yeah, I'll give you fifty million quid for him, can you turn that down? I don't think you can. But the old the other side of that is losing him. Who you put in there now you how you make out that midfield. And that's what I suppose I want to move on to now. Obviously we've got Dominic Calvert Lewin's back for the red car being overturned. I actually thought he should have got an extra three games because it was that bad of a time. <laughs> I'm only joking. Please, I'm only joking, given what I said. Um, but yeah, it's, it's it's a massive, massive boost to have him there. 
because I imagine for half the week, unless they were known any sooner than everybody else, you would have had Dice looking at, at Beto thinking this is the only option we've got here against what well, a side that's eff- effectively in a title race. Yeah, well, I, I think one thing about the about Calvert Lewin as well is that you could see how absolutely distraught he was. Um, even before he was shown the red card, I think he knew what was coming. Um, he, you know, even though that we could all see, I mean, I was on I was on the opposite side of the pitch in the away end, and I could see it was a great challenge. You know, from where I was before I'd seen the replay, once I'd seen the replay, I thought it was an absolute disgrace. But I think psychologically for Calvert Lewin, the place that, he, that he's in, when you look at like. The goal disallowed against Spurs. He's been on a run of, of not scoring. He's had chances and hasn't put them away. I think that was almost like the cherry on top. Um, where, where he probably would have, he he would have been, you know, thinking um, everything's going against him. So hopefully but, it'll. Do you get to a st- sorry, mate? Do you get to a stage now with him? And I think this has sort of crept in a lot in the last couple of seasons. I'm not just talking about the injury sort of thing because he he had some really bad luck with that. Do you start to look at him and think, do you know what? He's, he's not going to quite make it for us. He's not going to quite be the Everton striker that we thought when he was getting games for England a couple of seasons ago. And I, I look at him sometimes and, you know, I'm not going to say he's, re- he's gone back from what he became, but the progress you thought we'd all get from him doesn't seem like it's quite there. I don't know if you'd agree with that or not. Well, I think I think a big thing about it at the moment is confidence. Um, as I say, yeah. I think I think with like with any striker, goals breed confidence. And and at the moment, as I say, when he would have seen that red card and with the with the prospect of being out for three more games, I think his his confidence would have been on the floor. What I'm hoping is is that the fact that that's been rescinded, yeah. I'm hoping that it'll give him a, a boost and it'll have the opposite effect where he'll be thinking make him feel that, even better than he was. Yeah. yeah, do you know what I mean? And, and maybe psychologically, he'll think, well, maybe my looks changing slightly. And, and and sometimes with a striker, that's all you need. You just need a goal. It doesn't matter if it goes in off his ass or if it, or if he scores a bullet of a header. If it, he just needs a goal, he, he needs to get his name on the score sheet, and hopefully then he can go on a bit of a run. But I think it's important at times like this with any striker that these are the times when you have to stick by them. Um, you know, we saw it with Richarlison. Richarlison going to Spurs for me, yeah. one of his biggest mistakes was going to a team which what who weren't going to give him time. We all saw with Richarlison when he was at Everton, he could go eight or nine games without scoring, but then he'd score three, you know, he'd score four in his next five. You have to stick with players and you have to you have to keep you have to keep faith with them. I think Calvert Lewin as well. I feel sorry for him on a lot of occasions because I feel that he's very isolated, especially when Abdelaide the Core isn't alongside him. Um I, I think that in terms of the style that we play and you know, I, I'm I'm a huge fan, to be honest, of of the the football that they are playing. Um, I I've said time and time again, and it, playing the ball across the back four doesn't interest me whatsoever. I think the football that we're playing is a lot better than people give it credit for. But having said that, chances are going to be limited for your centre forward. I think a lot of the work that Calvert Lewin does in terms of occupying defenders and in terms of being a focal point up front for Everton, he probably sacrifices a lot of his own game in terms of goal scoring stats because of the amount that he does off the, you know, he, he does other than score goals. I think the amount of work rate that he puts in, and as I say, just being that focal point is massive for how we want to play football. So I think we, we have to stick with him. I think the goals will come. Um, But as I say, he just needs one to go in. He needs to do a new man. He asks when he falls over and it goes in <laughs> off his back. You know what I mean? <laughs> Something else, and at some point it, it will go his way because he's proven. He's proven that he can score goals, um, and I think it's up to us as supporters not to get on his back and to and to keep uh, and to stick with him. He's no Neil Morpay, put it that way. This lad's got talent. Yeah, I mean, I am playing devil's advocate with that, Paul. But when when you look at the fact for for several years now, he's been the only real striker that we've had there, um, who's been consistent, and by consistent, I mean at least scoring some goals. Um, you know, you look at his peak so far when he was getting into the England squad, you were looking at a player that, I don't know, one season he got to 18, 19 across the season, which is, you know, that that's invaluable now um, for most teams in, in the Premier League. So we, we had that asset there. I do feel, um, I do feel sorry for the lad several, on most occasions, to be honest with you, because it's a thankless task that he has sometimes when he's up there on his own. When you've not got to court in, I think you mentioned it, um, a few minutes ago about that. Not having the core there, Paul, is, is massive. It's a huge influence when he's actually in the side. Um, it, you know, I don't know if anybody's worked it out, so there'll be some sort of decent start where 
what our form is like when he's in and what it's like when he's out. Um, I'm, I'm not too sure on the status if he's if, if he gets back for Sunday against Aston Villa, but um, it, sort of the same question I thought on Pete there really with with Calvert Lewin. Um, I'm not going to ask if he's a fan of his or not because I think that that's not it's not a direct question. It's not a yes or a no, really, is it? But do you, do you see him getting back to what he, he used to be? Which you know, I think many fans would say, well, that's not that far away. But again, like like Pete said there. You get a goal, and then that's when it, it, everything starts. You know, when you got that goal allowed at, at Spurs, I probably have no doubt that he bagged a couple or, or you know, two or three since we played Spurs. So it's a difficult situation because he's not going to get dropped. He, he he's not going to get dropped at all. I don't think Dice is going to throw better in on his own and has Calvert Lewin on the bench, which I generally disagree with. I I'd, I'd like to mix it at times. You certainly wouldn't play the two of them together, though, would you? No, I mean, it's a really you know, uh, intriguing situation when you discuss Carver Lewin because I think um, you, you, you asked me would he ever get back to where he was. Well, I think the answer would be yes if we brought in the likes of James Rodriguez back into midfield, if we brought Luca Dean on the left side of attack because Carver Lewin's best season for when he scored those 18 goals when Ancelotti was manager, he had a constant stream of crosses from Luca Dean to, to aim for and he had the service from midfield from James Rodriguez. He gets nothing like that level of service. Now, Second thing, when Ancelotti was manager, the first thing he said to Calvert-Lewin was, stay in the box. I don't want you coming out the box. I don't want you on the wings. I don't want you... You're a forward. If you stay in the box, you will score goals. And unfortunately for Calvert-Lewin, since Ancelotti's left, the managers who followed him have expected him to be more of a team player, to be having, chasing down defenders, to be running up blind alleys on the wings, to be dropping back into midfield, and to be the outlet man all the time. Now, whether that's his natural game or not, I think is another subject for debate. If you're asking me, Will Carver Lewin score goals if he provide the service? I think the answer is yes. If Carver Lewin was playing for the top six team where he was getting uh, loads of chances created for him, would he take a lot of them? I think the answer once again is yes. But I think at Everson's system at the moment, he's still, whether he's scoring or not, he still carries out a crucial role in that system. Because I think the question you always ask is if you're not scoring goals, what are you bring to the team? And when Calvert Lewis is not playing, the team is definitely weaker, in my, in my opinion, because he's the outlet all the time. He can hold the ball up, he can bring other players in, in into the system, he can keep possession. And that's why when he's missing, we lose a vital part of our armory. So it, it's, a, it, it's, a, it's a really intriguing point, that because uh, I think Hanlon has, given his age, given his injury record, you might have to accept he's never going to get back to that peak he had on Ancelotti. But that's not to say he still can't be an effective forward for yeah. the team at all yeah. level in the Premier League. So I think, as uh, as Peace is in the case there, you have to keep faith with him because he, you know, uh, he's got a habit of scoring and vital goal. He's only got to look at that, uh, the win against Crystal Palace two seasons ago that you know, effectively ma- managed to keep us up. And I think, you know... I take your point about Besso, but if you're a Premier League defender and you see the Everton team sheet and you see Besso starts to the Calvin Lewin, well, I think you kind of think, well, yeah, I, I, yeah. I fancy playing against him a bit more, to be honest. Uh, you know, probably the same reaction that they had when they saw the Astros on the team sheet all those years ago. And uh, I think, I, I don't know, I, I think you have to persist with Calvin Lewin. Uh, I mean, it would be brilliant if, if, if at some stage, you would ever give him a clean bit of help. And I think I think from his point of view now, well, you know, he, he's getting to, to his mid to late 20s now. So, you know, if he doesn't kind of, you know, get back to where he was soon, you, you kind of wonder what the next stage of his career is. Because I think you said before, Dave, but you no, know, he, he, was, he was being picked for England. Lots of top six teams were kind of floating around, showing interest in him. Whether one of those clubs would go for Calvert-Lewin or not now, I'm not quite sure. But I think we're definitely a better team with Calvert-Lewin in the side. But I also like the fact that Besso is a natural replacement, which Neil Mopey never was for when Calvert-Lewin is not yeah. fit. Yeah, yeah, I think that's a um, small, small bit of light behind the tunnel there, isn't it, to say that, Les? I mean, do you know what, what, what uh, Paul was mentioning there about the age he's got? You, you get a point if it's that he's like this, where you're thinking, wh- wh- when when can you make anything from him? Would you, would you eventually look at selling him? And that's a long, long, long way down the road, given that we've got Petro and nobody else as an alternative striker. But I think I think that's an excellent point, the way uh, Paul's worded that there in terms of, it's it's debatable whether he gets back to the peak we've seen him at. Yeah, as Paul said, it's it's the way different managers have used him. Now, thankfully, Dice didn't flog him as much as other managers did. 
Um, I think a Benito stayed married as much longer ago than Calvert Lewin would still be a footballer because he would have <laughs> ran he would have ran him into the ground that much because <laughs> his job was more important than Calvert Lewin's fitness. Thankfully, Dice didn't look at it like that and he saw the benefits of getting him fit. My only worry with him is, and I slightly disagree with Paul about um I do think he's I do think the team looks better when he's in. But I think the form he's been in the last few games, like I think particularly against Palace, I think we look better than the 10 minutes Beto came on for that game, to be honest. I think I think he gave their defence a little bit more trouble. So he, he's one of those players when he's good, he's really good and he and he does everything that you want from a striker. But I think as the goals have dried up, I think his performances have got a little bit less and less and less impactful. And I think I would probably give Beto a, a run just to see, yeah. now, um, just to see what he can do, see if he can, you know, you know, run a defence ragged for 60 minutes, then bring Calvert-Lewin on, maybe build his confidence up that way. As Paul said, though, the good thing is we do have that option now, so we're not sticking Neil Mope on for an hour, and like he's doing absolutely nothing. Um, so there is the option that we've got that like for like, but I, I just think he doesn't look too confident. There was there was a chance where he, he got flagged offside eventually, I think, we had a one-on-one, I don't know if it was against Spurs, and he, he took it really close to the keeper, and it just looked like a striker who was like, I'm not sure what to do here. Now, if he's in good form, he knocks it right round and taps it in. So mm. I think there are issues there with him, aside from his injuries, which Touchwood looked to have cleared up a little bit. At least he's on a, he's on a decent run fitness-wise. I think form's a bit of an issue for him. And it's, it's not just his fault as well. I think I said this in the last post-match. And Pete just said it before, he's looking isolated. I think when the team's not doing so well, they drop back, they drop further and further back. So he's the only man up front. Um, especially, I think, when we played that five at the back against Wolves, you could see that the wingers were not acting as forwards at all. Everyone was dropping deeper and deeper back. Um, so that doesn't help him either. He does need support. He's you know, he used to he used to win his own flick ons, which was never ideal. And we never want to see him doing that again because no strike staff do that. But he does need support. And it is quite glaring that when the core is not in the team, he doesn't have that support. So mm-hmm. there's that to it as well. It, it's like maybe the core come back, see what happens there. Everything might pick up again and everything might be good. But it's, yeah, it's a tricky one with him. Um, that's why Dice gets paid the big bucks, isn't it? I suppose. <laughs> Well, to, to have us fail. <laughs> <laughs> well, everyone else else, so why not? <laughs> uh, just just to finish off, um, from the three, I'll go back to you first, Pete, on this. Your best mate, McNeil, is out. Um, don't know how long for the foreseeable future. Um, aside from buzzing off him, who replaces him? Uh, I think me and Matt discussed this on the Monday, uh, the Blue Monday show. Who would you put in there? Um, you know, the, my answer at the time, uh, for my pennyworth in this was Dan Juma. Um and there's a couple of couple of bits of um of time I thought about you maybe give Dobbin a go given you know when he, he was on such a high after scoring that goal against Chelsea. Um but you know Harrison would you put across the other side. Dan Juma has got he's he's a, he's quite um, versatile. I mean he can go across that he can, he, he, I mean he seems to be an automatic replacement for him. Um when you look at what he did uh, against Spurs where he should have scored probably two when he came on. He has a he has a positive effect when he gets on. He's he's like a typical forward winger where you think this lad is top class, but then in the next three games you think oh, I can't remember that he played in that game. Do you know what I mean? So um, would you agree with that, Dan Juma? Or who else would you think about putting in on that left hand side? Well I think I think the thing that I'm I'm worried the most about is is whether he sticks with this three at the back and and plays Mikalenko as more of a, a left wing back. I think that would that would be um, the worst scenario for me because I think that that three at the back has been proven that it's it's not it doesn't work it doesn't work effectively for us. Um, I think Aston Villa would have a field day against us if we were to play that that system again. Um, but yeah, Dan Juma. The thing with him as well, I mean, his agent's been on TalkSport this week, hasn't he? And he's been talking about how they've been speaking to, is it Leon or Leon? Leon in, yeah, I think it was Leon in France they've been talking to. Um, <laughs> I, I don't know whether he'd be in the right frame of mind to be starting starting games for us at the moment. Um, and as I say, it just depends on the on the system that Dice wants to play. Um, you know, well, I mean, if you, if you went if you went with the five that you've said there, and you'd have Michelin as a left wing back. 
Do you then have a, a tighter three-man midfield and you don't have anybody particular on the left-hand side? Yeah, that's I mean, what I mean. I that, think, I, yeah, I think I think that's what he'd have to. He'd, he'd probably be looking more to more to going for. Um, it depends on the fitness of Abelay Decore as well. Is there any any? I've not actually heard, but if there's any, no, news I haven't on, heard any, did, any whether, news about him. I don't know whether you have Paul about what's going on yeah, with uh, yeah, Decore and he's close yeah. or anything. Yeah, no. Anything. So but, again, I mean, it, I suppose it's more positive when it's quiet, really, rather than <laughs> rather than come up and say he's got six months out or something like that. But um, just before we move on, then, Pete, what would you say? It's going to happen on Sunday. I mean, this is a big ask. One of the sides that's best in the Premier League. Do you know what? I've I've been a big fan of yeah. Aston Villa, and and the reason that is is because Everton are very very close and similar to Aston Villa regarding history and things like that. And they've been in the mire. They've been relegated. I'm not saying that that's going to happen with us, but they they're the side that's been up and down and successful side. Um, through years gone by to see somebody like that who's got a top top manager in. Hate that term, by the way. A top manager in who uh, look like they're going to have a, a little run at the title. I know they've lost the last couple. This is a, this is a, a huge, a huge mountain for us to to uh, climb, isn't it? What do you think is going to happen then? Huge, huge uh, game, H- huge test. I think we both said, um, you know, in our pre-season show, didn't we? The warm up, and I think Les said as well. We mentioned Aston Villa as a team who we were, yeah. who we were excited. Just to, to my credit, season. which gets ripped all the time. I said I fancied them to finish in the top four. You did, so yeah. Before, before yeah. everyone's backslating <laughs> me, kicking off on seven, 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 and saying that Calvert Lewin should have got sent off, and not because he was he put a foul in. It was I don't know why I'm saying this eight million times, but the reason I said it was because of the incompetence of the people that run official football. That is why I said it. It wasn't a foul, but to them it was. And that's why Idiot runs over, sees it on the on the telly, gets told, yeah, red card because the studs are up. That is why he was sent off. Not me. Not me. But anyway, going back to me. Your fault, Dave. Well, you know, yeah. Absolutely. Uh, things, on, things on this podcast often get thrown at me, so I'm not too bothered, to be honest with you. But, um, yeah, sorry, Pete. It's all right. Yeah, but I, I, th- I just think that they... I think they got the right manager in at the right time. I think that they've. I think Aston Villa, to be honest, were underperforming on on the on the slippy Gerard. Um, I think that they they had a lot of or have a lot of attacking talent in their side. I think they're well organised. They they've. I mean, clearly their their home form in particular has been absolutely outstanding uh, over the last sort of eighteen months. Um, but I think you know at Goodison Park again we've got to at some point we've got to turn a corner with our home form as well in terms of in, in terms of getting a good result. Obviously we had a couple of decent results against Newcastle and Chelsea, but I just I just feel like this is the type of game that we need to be winning. <laughs> I know that sounds it, it pro- it's probably a bit optimistic considering where Aston Villa are and where we find ourselves, but if we can frustrate them and we can um you know do a dice on them, I think I think we've got every chance. Um. That's not to say that I don't really rate Aston Villa because I do. I think Ollie, Ollie Watkins in particular is a, is a striker. You know, it's sort of you can see the career tra- trajectory and compare him directly to Dominic Calvert Lewin over the last sort of three or four seasons. The level that Ka- Calvert Lewin was up, was at under Ancelotti, and where Ollie Watkins was at um, even two seasons ago with Villa, they seem to have gone in opposite directions. Um, oh Watkins as a player, who I think is absolutely outstanding and uh, and someone who. You know, is just a natural, natural goal scorer. I think they're going to be dangerous. But as I say, um, I, I still, I still believe that we've got a lot of quality in our side, and I think that we can be hard to break down. Um, I, I think it, it's it's going to be a tough one. I think we said we sort of said before we go into every game at the moment, believing we're either going to we're either going to win or we're going to lose. There's no draws. <laughs> no in between. No yeah. in between. No in between. What are you saying? Then what's what are you saying? I've I've said all that. I'm going to say one one. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, I'd, I'd take one. I bite your head off now for for one one. Um, what would you say, Paul? Yeah, I mean, it's it's, it's going to be an intriguing game, isn't it? Uh, I think. I mean, Aston, I watched Aston Villa Man United game, and, and I was I was quite encouraged by the way they collapsed with conceding three goals in the second half after being two and up. So there's a definite weakness of vulnerability there. I think as pieces in the case there as well. We we have to be in the situation whereby, so that that's the phone ringing in the background. I apologise. That's all right, mate. We can't we can't hear it anyway. 
Oh, okay. Oh, oh. <laughs> right, my my dog came running in about five minutes ago. <laughs> yeah, my, my my three dashes have normally got both more than me on this podcast, but go on. Yeah, so going back to what I said, I think um our record against Villa is pr- pretty poor, isn't it? We haven't won any of our last last nine league games against them. However, we did beat them in the league cup earlier on the season at Villa Park. So we have to you know we can we have shown we can beat them on the day. I think, as Peter said there, the home form is crucial for Everton. We have to start getting more and more points at home to pull us away from the bottom there. I mean, they're not all good teams, no question about that. But I do think, out of all the teams in the top four, they're the weakest defensively. Uh, I would love us to put Martinez on under pressure at some stage during the game as well. That, that'll give me... A particular... He's a horrible, horrible man. Eh? I cannot that's... stand that fella. That, that'll give me a particular personal delight. Uh, yeah, think... exactly, right. Exactly <laughs> yeah. right. Yeah. I'd love Cavaliers to pull in the back of the net from a challenge from a thumb corner or something like that, but yeah. never mind. Uh, but yeah, <laughs> I, I, I agree with Peter. I, I think we can get at least a draw from this, but I think it, it's crucially important that, that we score first. And going back to what Peter said before as well, I think it's a, you know, the result will depend on the formation we go for. I think if we go for the back five, I'm, le- I'm less I'm less convinced about the one draw being achievable. Uh, I think if, if we stick to his normal system, and if the Decor- if the Corley plays, I fancy us to win. If the Corley doesn't play, I think it's a draw. Yeah, do you go along with that, Les? I mean, he, yeah, he's, I'll be, he's I'll the most to throw on there. No, I'll be inclined to agree there. To be honest, I, I think uh, I think a lot does hinge on how we approach the game. Um, as both the lads have said, don't really want five at the back. Uh, if we do, it's got to be three in midfield. You, you cannot put Onana and Garner on their own in midfield because uh, it just won't work and it'll just it'll just invite pressure. Um, if we do play the normal system, I would throw Dan Juma right and probably Harrison left because the thing the thing with the inverted wingers, which I do like it, but when you've got Calvert Lewin there, there's no crosses coming in because you've always yeah. got to check back to, to cross it in. So I think the one thing that's disappointed me with that is they don't swap. So much they don't tend to swap over. Yeah, it used to be a, it used to be a positive trend, didn't it? Where wingers. Yeah, wing. yeah. So you know, so sometimes you're cutting in, and then sometimes you swap. So you got a right footer on the right, left footer on the left. Hit the crosses in. I think we need to get back to doing some basics like that. Getting to the touchline, getting crosses in, packing the box. Which again, if the core comes in, he's another body who's always in the box. So yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna go with a, a nerve jangling one nil. I think. <laughs> um, <laughs> like maybe one where we score early on and then get leathered for the rest of the game. You know, something really horrible like that. Yeah. Get, I think I'll go for that. And I already can't cope. And also one thing that's against us, Sunday, two o'clock, has got to be the worst. Yeah. Awesome. It's all, that's the only one that's slightly better than our 12 on a Saturday. I, don't, I prefer our 12 on a Saturday, you know. Do you really? Saturday. Yeah. Oh, I mean, that's the absolute worst for me. Anyway, <laughs> um, the thing that intrigues me most is Watkins, like uh, like Pete mentioned there. He's an outstanding player. Uh, they got him really cheap as well. It was it a couple of seasons ago from Brentford? Um, he's been top class for them. Be interesting to see how Brantwaite handles him, how he comes up against him, and, and obviously Tarkovsky as well. Um, I, I can't. <laughs> I'm gonna get done again for this. I can't see us not not conceding at least one goal from them, which means we have to score. A minimum of two. I don't see us scoring two goals at the moment the way we are. Um, the way he's going to have to play it without McNeil. Um, Calvert Lewin as well. I mean, it, it, look, I'll, I'll be going cock a hoop if we're sitting here at four o'clock on Sunday afternoon saying he's back two goals and we've got a draw. I, I just feel as if, you know, I, I'd, I'd have us taking a really horrible, stinking one all draw or nil nil draw. I would be delighted with that. Um, and let's hope that that keeps us up <laughs> above the bottom three with what's going on with Burnley and Luton tomorrow night. But um, that's it, gents. Thank you very much for joining me on uh, what are we Thursday morning, rare time for a weekly. But um, you know, you certainly look better than me. I haven't got up so early anyway. So <laughs> um, thanks to everyone for listening to us as well. Uh, plenty coming up. I know Matt's doing the preview of the game against Villa. Uh, obviously, we'll have post time after that. And also, Les, you can you need to plug what you've been doing with your show yesterday. Oh, yeah, I've got a new show called Old New Borrowed Blue. Uh, basically, it's a nice one where we focus on the positive stuff about Everton. So it's all, all the things you like, your favourite former player, favourite current player, favourite loan player, and just your favourite thing, favourite Everton or your favourite thing about Everton. So, uh, yeah, give that a listen. And if anyone wants to get involved, just let me know. 
And my, mine's positive if you want to listen to it, by the way, as well. My, mine's really positive. I didn't start thinking about my favourite defeats and stuff like that. But I'm sure <laughs> Keith and Paul will both get... Keith and Paul will both get on with you as well, Les, in the, in the coming yeah. future too. Yeah, that'll be uh, fast. And also, the last thing to say is, will you please keep voting for us on the Sports <laughs> Podcast Awards? Um, we're, we're told, <laughs> I feel as if we're the little group fighting against some of the big boys, because if you look at who we're coming up against, there's loads from big companies like The Athletic. They've put in their um, various podcasts they've got from different teams. There's... Um, Various for the ones who are financially boosted when we're probably the seven 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 of the group. So um, <laughs> do, do keep giving us a vote. We always have the, the link all over our social media and all that. And uh, yeah, let's hope we're the only toffees in there as well. So you sort of have to vote for us if you can be bothered. So thanks, lads. Uh, have a good day. And uh, let's hope for a win against Villa on Sunday. <laughs>